What a pleasure to be joined by Ralph Kruger. He's like James Bond. <laughs> you know, one day he'll be in Switzerland, one day he'll be in Russia, one day he'll be in England, and one day he'll be in Buffalo, New York. Now you're in <laughs> Buffalo. Ralph, great yeah. to see you. Good to see you, Pierre. Nice, yeah, to, nice to be here. Um, quick question for you. You have one of the most unique stories about from the coaching perspective in the NHL. Yeah. But you said something last year before you took the job. You were offered the job and you came and hung around in the city of Buffalo yeah. just for a day by yourself. What were you trying to find out? Well, it was a unique situation for me having been a 25-year head coach and then stepping into another sports world like the English Premier League and to really be sure that it wasn't just only my heart that was going to pull me back into hockey. I needed to be certain that there was growth here, that the environment I was stepping into at this age was going to be one where I didn't want to be a part of a rebuild. I wanted to be a part of a team surging into that next level mm -hmm. of development. So there were so many different things. But above all, I promised my wife I would take her somewhere where it would be fun to live. And uh, so I did that first. I did the wife thing, make sure that Glenda was uh, going to be happy. And mm -hmm. I ended up walking through some communities here and found some owner operator spots really uh, that first weekend where I, I saw a lot of Europe here in Buffalo. I think it's a sleeper city. People don't see the, the culture and the intellect actually of the, of the city itself, which I was able to pick up on the weekend and the sports fanaticism here we all know about. That was the, the most important piece probably of them all, but I'm really pleased to be here in Buffalo on multiple fronts now. So you talked about Europe. Yeah. Uh, my first meetings were you were over in Europe, in Germany and Switzerland. You were a player in Germany, you coach in Switzerland, you helped build the Swiss program, yeah. let's be honest. So what led you to Europe? I know where yeah. you're from, I know yeah. St. John's Ravenscourt where you went to prep school, yeah. and yeah. I know about Steinbeck, Manitoba, yeah. where you grew up, but what led you to Europe? Well, I think number one, I, 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 did, I did play with Kelly Kissio my last year of junior in Calgary and had a pretty good season, but I was pretty realistic about my chances making the NHL at that time. And, I just didn't have the foot speed, but I loved the game of hockey so much. And having a German passport, it was a path that so many Canadians go on, is to Europe, play on national teams there. I was able to experience some world championships and had a 13-year-old career, 13-year uh, career where I was able to experience hockey at the level I was capable of playing at the time. So just my love for the game actually pulled me over to Europe and then uh, I, I planned to try the coaching thing for one year and 25 years later it became my passion, my life and my everything professionally. Your vision for the Swiss program in particular I think is phenomenal. Can yeah. you talk about how you came about developing players and developing yeah. the Swiss system? So if you look at the Swiss players today, one of the things I, I, I have is a complete blend of the European and Canadian game. So everything I've ever coached has both elements in it. So it helps me here in Buffalo where we have 10 Europeans. Mm -hmm. But then at that time, it was unique in that Switzerland was an all out offensive, no defense mm -hmm. kind of skilled country. Mm -hmm. And we brought grit into that offense. We brought grit, which doesn't mean running over bodies. And that's the game today actually that's being played in the National Hockey League. It's a different kind of grit today. It's the courage to go to the front of the net. It's a courage to, to, you know, to, to, to get inside uh, when you have the puck, but also defensively to, to, to have that body position and to pressure the puck. You don't have to finish the hits as much anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did with the Swiss program is we really changed the way the Swiss mm -hmm. team played hockey and uh, competed. And I was able to spend three Olympic cycles with that group. And I'm you know, so pleased that there's a whole team of Swiss players over here now. The door was knocked down by Mark Schreit. Mm -hmm. He's the one that had to battle oh, as yeah. a D, you know, to become a defenseman took him three years. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it was, it was that. And I still today have a very global game in my mind when I'm coaching, probably largely influenced by the Scandic, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Finland, and Canadian hockey kind of all blended together. Can you tell me about what your feeling was when in 06 in Torino, Switzerland pulled up the major yeah. upset against Canada? It was the day that Switzerland changed its direction completely. So all the kids playing in the NHL today were between 8 and 12 years of age watching us beat Canada 2-0 on top two Paul, Paul DiPietro goals. A Canadian guy yeah, from Sudbury, Ontario. Who, who, <laughs> who actually helped to change the, the mentality of the program. And it, it, was, it was a absolutely, size, it was a seismic shift in the way the Swiss people believed in their potential and what was going to happen. And that game 
was over and above any game that I was able to be a part of. Uh, what it changed was was the the belief that we could play against top countries in the world and compete with them and also go to the NHL because Mark still wasn't really a fixed player over mm -hmm. here, Mark Streit. But it was a game I will never forget and uh, you know forever will be will be a special one in my memory. What does a Nico Heischer going number one yeah. overall mean to a program like the Swiss program? Oh, it just gives it so much confidence and Switzerland has invested so much in youth hockey. Every professional team there has to have from top to bottom a professionally led program of development and that's one thing that's put Switzerland on the map and so many international coaches are in there working in the trenches I profited from all the work that was done in the youth stages but they have professional coaches for under 16 under 12 these are fully mm -hmm. paid professionals that are in there and that's why it's not by chance or by luck that Switzerland is developing these players it's yeah. uh, it's it's their program right through the ranks. Well, and you were the godfather, and congratulations because yeah. that's a nice major feather. It's another major Thank feather you. in your cap. So this is an interesting one. <laughs> You're the head coach of the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. Things don't work out, and you leave hockey. Yeah. You leave hockey to go to football, not yeah. American football, <laughs> no. soccer. Yeah. Ralph, you got to help me out here. Yeah. How how did that help happen? Yeah. Well, the beauty beauty Pierre is that you know. All of us working in sports, are, are, we have leadership experiences and because of, I had two little kids when I started coaching and it was quite frightening actually to be a head coach and knowing the, the dangers of the profession and how longevity is not your <laughs> friend and so I threw myself into studying leadership and teams in 93, 94 at the beginning of my coaching career and I just never stopped and it, it took me on to some really good ex safaris actually with different companies with different experiences all the way to the world economic forum where i was able to become part of a panel for for five years and and so it was that growth actually that opened the door to to, to soccer slash football it was um first of all the pain of uh leaving the edmonton program where i felt we were on the cusp mm -hmm. but the Respect I received from Steve Eiserman and Mike Babcock to hire me 48 hours for Team Canada mm -hmm. going to Saatchi. But that gave me a time to think. And in that time came this leadership opportunity in the Premier League, which was, for me, I thought, what a way to grow and learn where you're actually then not involved in the front, but you can still work with the players on the off-field kind of mm -hmm. uh, spaces. And so for five and a half years, I was able to grow and learn so much there. And I'm hoping I'm bringing it in here in Buffalo uh, as a new package and a new viewpoint. But it happened by chance because of my, my excitement of studying leadership and how to treat people right. I, I just... I'm obsessed with creating cultures and environments where people are treated properly and in the right way and still finding the buttons to push to hold people accountable for. And that's a tough, mm -hmm. it's a tough line that we, that we are wandering back and forth upon to get players and the people you lead to do that. But I'm still in search for that, that, um, that process. How much has your style changed as a coach from when you started yes. to where you are right now? A lot. A lot. I... I was much more erratic and emotional and I'm able in good and bad times to keep the picture small. I used to always think it was important to speak about end results and about where we're going to be in three to five years and I've learned as I get older, I'm 60 now, that that will take care of itself if you really are able to spend most of your minutes in the present. Mm -hmm. That yes, we need to know where we're going, the direction should be clear. We need to know what happened and look at it quickly, process it, take the lessons with, but more than anything, we should spend most of our life here. And, uh, and that's what we're doing in Edmonton right now. And that's what I've gotten much, much, much better at. And maybe it's because of age. I know my lifeline's getting shorter, but uh, above all, I'm a person that's really able to try to find excellence in the moment, whatever that moment is and uh, be focused and concentrated on that is the biggest change mm -hmm. and biggest shift for me as a coach where I would maybe come in and speak about if, if and when and there and first place and all that stuff and now it's more about let's be, let's be excellent right now. If it's a day off, let's have an excellent day off and if it's a game day, let's be bang on for the mm -hmm. game and so on and it seems to be, um, it seems that the players here in Buffalo have embraced that attitude. I know the pain of being fired as a coach in the yeah. NHL. I know how I dealt with my pain. How did yeah. you deal with yours when you got fired in Edmonton? Well, 
first of all, just like I said, people reaching out, like phone calls immediately, Tom Rennie, uh, Mike Babcock I already mentioned, you know, Hitchcock and so on and so forth. There were a lot of coaches that reached out. That was good. Uh, but f I needed to get actively refocused on what I was going to do now and find another path as quickly as possible because the only person you hurt if you get bitter and negative and critical is yourself. That's the only person that actually gets hurt. And I luckily my instincts and all the leadership work that I was doing, I was going into companies telling them no matter what you have to find a positive process. No matter what, if you just had the worst day of your life, if your company just got a 20% stock reduction or whatever, you've got to find a positive process, which doesn't mean big smile on your face. I didn't have a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. I didn't sleep for about, you know, six, seven weeks mm -hmm. very well. And I woke up, you know, with all kinds of things going on in my mind because I was all in in Edmonton, because I loved those players so much and because I believed in what we were doing and it was gone. Mm -hmm. I had to accept that. So yes, there was pain. But in my waking hours, I was driven towards solutions. I was driven towards a new process. And that's what we have to do when we're, when we're smacked in the face. We have to get ourselves back on that track of finding solutions, finding new dreams and goals to reach for. And it takes a while when you're so deep in a dream or goal that you're working on. It took a while and Team Canada gave me that, that opportunity. But the hockey school I went through as a coach in that time, you know, with Claude Julian, Lindy Ruff, Hitchcock, Babcock, all of us changing all information with each other, everything on the table with the Eisermans and Hollands and, uh, you know, the leaders that were around mm -hmm. us at the time and spending a year in that program uh, deepened. Yeah. So look at, look at the opportunity I got, Pierre. I mean, wow. And then the Premier League. Uh, I would not want to change that with anything. I, I have no craving to go back, but wow, what an experience that was. And that was built really on my attitude. If it would have been negative and I would have been throwing all kinds of darts at the people in Edmonton that maybe made the decisions, that would have just stalled my evolution. So let's go to a tell the truth <laughs> now. You just won a huge game in yeah. Edmonton. Yeah. What was a plane line ride back? Yeah. What was it like? Well, first of all, the players gave me the game puck, which they don't give the coach very often. Yeah. But I, I, that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, the guys uh, understood the value of the game, even though I didn't really speak about it. Uh, they, were, they, they were pleased. And yeah, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a revenge person. So I didn't have that kind of feeling, but I felt really proud to be the Buffalo Sabres coach that whole day in Edmonton after what happened. And um, on the way back on the plane, you know, there was, there was some, some fun and jubilation. But, you know, the way it is in the NHL, we move on quickly. And I think it's, uh, it's in a nice, quiet way that I was able to enjoy that, that victory and back to work here today. What's the best way to describe your relationship with the Bagula family, the owners of the Buffalo Sabres? So when I spent that weekend here in May, first of all, the ice was just breaking. <laughs> and uh, I'm good. I'm good. This with is North like Manitoba. <laughs> I'm good. I, I grew up in Winnipeg, so uh, Steinbach slash Winnipeg. So I, I know all about cold. So <laughs> people think this is cold. They have no idea. No idea. And uh, you know, I've spent most of my time in Switzerland at 5,000 feet. So so I'm not afraid of the cold. So that didn't scare me at all. What I embraced. I I've mentioned one thing here already in the podcast, and that's that I really care about being in environments where people are treated properly. Mm -hmm. And it seems more fitting than ever right now in the environment that we're in. And I, when I met and, and have brainstormed with Jason Botterill over the years, mm -hmm. it was always the feeling that culture meant more to him than anything. And when I met Terry and Kim, and we spent, uh, you know, we were planning to spend an hour together, it ended up being four. It was just so natural. Uh, we spoke about everything um, on top of the hockey and I could just feel their love number one for the city and for the people and the fans getting what they deserve here. The dedication they've shown for the Buffalo Bills and the Buffalo Sabres is tremendous. Mm -hmm. but they're just very real. I mean I, every interaction I've had with them since then and I had to deal with a lot of billionaires in my time in the Premier League <laughs> and a lot of owners in the Premier League and they're just very natural, very real, and come out of the heart. And this was an environment where, I mean, all the options that I had fell away that weekend. Uh, I could have returned to the Premier League. I could have come into another role, possibly in the NHL. But uh, they, that was the final push over the line that I wanted to be the Buffalo Sabres head coach and work in an environment where culture mattered above all. 
your eloquence is so apparent when, as you talk, uh, which is really unique for a hockey coach, I will tell you. Um, but I watch how you message with your players during the game, and you talked about how you've calmed down yeah, since yeah. you first started. Yes. And I'm seeing the results in Jack Eichel's play in yeah. particular. Yeah. How did you address Jack Eichel when you took over the job here? Well, it was excellent because uh, our first meeting was in Slovakia, and uh, we planned to have some drinks together, and we ended up, you know, with his with his uh, partner Jack and I, we ended up spending four hours together, and I would say we maybe spoke about hockey for 20 minutes or 25 minutes, mm -hmm. and since then it's just been organic. We we don't have. Uh, hours and hours of conversations. It's just a very natural exchange of body language and eye contact and mm -hmm. and some meetings here and there, of course. But above all, I felt in him the competitor that he is and the, the hunger he has to lead a team to victory and in the right way. And his individual statistics or what he does in that process are less important for him than the team. So he puts team first, and I really felt that in him right away. And since, since that first meeting, it's just been easy, I have to say, really easy. And he's an amazing athlete, an amazing hockey player, mm -hmm. but also a person. He's embracing the game without the puck. I believe he will be the most complete player in the National Hockey League when he's done. I, his, his tracking speed and his mm -hmm. game without the puck his, uh, his, his willingness to pressure and get it back is as good as any of the top players in the league. So with that offensive skill set comes this, this other person and he, he is um, putting that into action and what an example he is. Works as hard as anybody in practice or on or off the ice. So uh, the relationship is very easy, very natural, very organic, and you know, we, we look forward to every day together. Ralph, am I overstating it by saying he's a legitimate MVP candidate this year? Oh, for sure. There's no question that he, uh, in all aspects, will be in that circle. And what, as a coach, you're always looking to manage people. Yes. What's made the Buffalo Sabres better this year in terms of your management of the players? So a lot of excellent <clears throat> work's been done here over the last few years. I, I've been involved in the rebuild processes when when players are 18, 19, 20 and mm -hmm. you know we've got some core guys that are in their fifth season in the league now and we we still have Rasmus that we're working with how exciting will his future be Rasmus Dahlin yeah is, Rasmus oh. Dahlin because we have three Rasmus <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly but uh, you know I I like where where the group is at right now and I I really really am excited with uh, with, with the phase that we're in here overall. I don't want to put too much pressure yeah, on you. We've no. been friends for a long time, so yeah. this is my last one for you. Yeah, no. Complete this sentence. The Buffalo yeah. Sabres will make the playoffs if... We continue to keep the picture small and continue to get better every day. So that's what we're working on every day. Improvement, small picture, and... Uh, Keep the white noise outside of our locker room, and we're going to be fine. Merry Christmas, yeah. Ralph. Thanks. Thank Merry you. Christmas Thank also you. to everybody Thank behind you. the Thank camera. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.